Let's open this morning to Luke chapter 11 as we study the topic, Thy Will Be Done. This morning we're going to continue with the study that we have in the model prayer as we see how God is showing us how we are going to pray to Him. And even though we may not use these specific words every single time we pray, at the same time this embodies our mind as we begin to approach God. It tells us what our first desires should be. It tells us what our mentality should be, and it tells us how we should prepare our hearts to look to the glory of God as our chief concern before we even look to God to ask for daily provisions. This past week, uh, we very often at night begin to talk with our children about the Bible. I sometimes use various catechisms. I sometimes read a word of God and then ask them questions. And a few times this week, I said, let's repeat the Lord's Prayer. And I was curious to see if they could do it or if they would just follow along with me. I stopped at one point, and after reading it on Sunday and at the house over the past couple of weeks, they were saying it just fine. I was like, I'm embarrassed. At their age, I could not say the Lord's Prayer like this. And so I've been really impressed. And so again this morning, before we continue and dive into the Word of God, let's read it one more time. So it's embedded in our memory. It's embedded in our mind. And Lord willing, it may be embedded in our hearts. So let's look at Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And when he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Here our Lord is again teaching them certain principles that we should adopt as mentalities as we approach God in prayer. It starts again by addressing who God is. He is not some God out there. He is not some God that is far and distant from us, as many pagan religions may teach. He's not out there that's unapproachable. But he is right here. He's close. He's immediate. He's next to us. He is our Father. But equally, he is our Father, which art in heaven. He's a God that's not only right here, but he's a heavenly Father. He is a God who is good, who is kind. He is, who is much better than all of the earthly fathers, as Jesus says later in this chapter. If ye, being evil, know how to give your children good gifts, imagine this heavenly Father who is all good, all knowing, all wise. He's not just like an earthly father, but he's a heavenly father. Praise God for that. And it goes on to tell us our petitions, the first two we've looked at the past couple of weeks. And if you've missed those, you can check those out uh, either through Facebook or, Lord willing, going to put those online soon um, so y'all can listen to them. But here when it says, Our Father, which out art in heaven, he goes on to say, First chief desire, hallowed be your name, or may we reverence you. May your name be reverenced in the earth. Then to say, Thy kingdom come. An outflow of wanting God to be hallowed is that his kingdom would be manifest and his kingdom would rule in this world. So it goes from wanting God to be hallowed to then wanting his kingdom to be fully implemented here. Again, our first desire in prayer is what? I'm often to bow my head and say, Lord, I need this, I need that. I'm often like a child. My children may not even walk up and say, hey, Dad. You know, I may walk in the house or Rebecca may walk in the house and it's not. Well, with Rebecca, it's who gets the hug first. That's typically what it is, you know. But when Dad walks in, it's not that, hey, Dad, can you set up the Xbox? It's not, hey, Dad, we love you. I hope that you're happy and had a good day. It's, hey, Dad, we need. Yeah. And it, it may sound funny, but we often adopt that in prayer. But we see God puts our focus on something different. God, may your name be reverenced and glorified first, because we understand that it's not always may your kingdom come because in your kingdom your name is reverenced. And from that, the very next outflow from it, because even though we're separating these as petitions, petition one, petition two, this third petition, though we can separate it as a petition, as it's saying thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth, nonetheless, 
Nonetheless, it flows from the other one. How is it that God's kingdom is going to be fully manifest, implemented? How is it that God's kingdom is going to be seen in this world? It is going to be seen because God's will is going to be done. His kingdom cannot be found if his will is not being done. And we're going to kind of dissect that a little bit in understanding the will of God. The will of God we kind of have to view in a few different ways here. So, thy will be done. It's an outflow of thy kingdom come. How is it that his kingdom comes into this world? By his will being done. Okay, Christians traditionally dissect the will of God in two different ways. Two different ways we can think about the will of God. Now, first, we understand the will of God in how he does things. His active will, as I would call it. What he does. Um, He does this in various ways. He can actively call something. He can actively suffer something. He can actively permit or allow something. You see, when God says he does something, he does what he wants, right? Isaiah 46 tells us what? Isaiah 46 and verse 10 gives us a view of God and what he does. I'm in Jeremiah. (laughs) I was like, that's not the right verse. (laughs) Sometimes I look and I'm like, okay, I I know that it's in verse 10, so now I'm getting a little confused. But Isaiah chapter 46, not Jeremiah. Isaiah chapter 46, if I can get this new Bible to actually open up. 46... These things are going to last, but my goodness, they're frustrating. 46 and verse 10 reads, let's get there. It says in verse 9 first, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. He gives this first declaration of who God is. There's nobody like God. One thing about God is that we cannot say that we are like him in some sense. Now, in some ways, we can say we mirror God as an earthly father, as a as someone who has maybe a master, God's a master, somebody who's maybe doing something, an under-shepherd, God is a shepherd, but at the same time, nobody is like God. And this is the reason nobody is like God, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. He basically says, I'm going to do what I want, when I want, how I want, whenever I want to do it. And you're not going to say anything about it. You know, sometimes, and this is why nobody is like him in the sense, there are times that I want to do something that I'm not able to do. There are times I would desire to do something. There may be something in my household that I'm like, this is going to happen. And, well, (laughs) when you live in a household full of sinners, that the head of a household is a sinner, and everybody else is sinners, what you plan doesn't necessarily always get done, right? My counsel doesn't always stand. What I say does not necessarily always get done. And the difference between us and God is when God says, this is what I'm going to do, God does what he wants. Again, Nebuchadnezzar, who stand up in the book of Daniel, as he stood up and just declared, I am going, look at my kingdom, this is what I've done, this is what I'm going to do, and he's declaring himself, basically, before God, and saying, this is everything that I am. Finally, God got tired of it and just smacked him down. God put him down, and he finally, after he came to himself and his sense came back to him, when he finally came to the realization that what? that God is God, and there was none like him, and his counsel shall stand. He said, he who does his will in the armies of heaven and the inhabitants of earth. What a confession to make there. We see a picture of God that's not a God up there wringing his hand saying, oh, if they'll just do what I want, you know, if I can just get my will done. God does what he wants, right? (laughs) We're not going to stop God when he decides to do something. Now, yes, it's true that very often that As we will see, his prescriptive will we may not do on occasion, many occasions. Yet, when God decides to do anything, I cannot stop God from causing something, and his causing never contradicts what he has revealed in his word. That's something we're going to have to see in his prescriptive will, is that what God calls us never contradicts what he has commanded us to do. So God is not going to cause us to sin, make sense? Because he's commanded us not to. But at the same time, you're not going to stop God from causing what he wants to cause, suffering what he wants to suffer, permitting what he wants to permit, and allowing what he wants to allow. God does what he wants. 
The second way that we can understand the will of God, as we see it in the active will first, of what God does, actively does, is his prescriptive will. What is it that God prescribes to us to do? Or his preceptive will, precepts that he gives us in the word of God. He prescribes certain things, right? He says, do this and don't do that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. You can even see it in that context as he is there writing to this church who is struggling, as it were, to some degree. And he's commanding them. They're kind of worried, as it were, about the second coming. You can see that in both of the epistles. Both are very focused on the second coming of Christ. And he reminds them this, and I think this is very important as we understand the will of God and see how it works out in our life. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, I'll tell you, these pages are just frustrating this morning. I'm going to have to bring my old Bible next week. <laughs> Y'all should laugh at me right now because this is fun. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. For this is the will of God. Okay, this is the will of God. People ask, what is the will of God in my life? What is the will of God for me to do? What should I be doing? Instead of looking in the future of what God would do for our life, you know, what is God going to have for me in 10 years? You know, that's sometimes what people mean when they say, what is the will of God for my life? And I can tell you, if I look back 10 years ago at age 24, I would have not guessed how it would have been to this point. Let's say 20 years ago at age 14, I really wouldn't have guessed what my life would have looked like at this point. But typically when we see the will of God being presented to us about what we should be doing, it's not given a full revelation of, okay, this is your entire life. This is what I'm going to have you to do like a boss necessarily would and say, I'm going to move you to this position, this position, to this position. But he gives us precepts or prescriptions that we should be doing. In other words, you see here, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. The will of God is what for your life? Your growth in grace and holiness your sanctification. What is the first principle we see of what is the will of God for us? That we would be actively growing in holiness. That's the very first thing that he gives for us. The will of God is that we would be growing in grace. You know, sometimes we think it's this grand and glorious idea of what is the will of God? Am I going to, you know, we, we say, oh, the places you will go, right? You know, that, oh, I think that's a Dr. Seuss book probably. Oh, the places you will go. It at least sounds like something that he would say. And we place that and we put it in the minds of children. Look at what you're going to be doing. And that is exciting. It is exciting to think of what my children will one day grow up to be. It's especially exciting to know that one day they will grow up to move out. But <laughs> past that, thinking of what they will one day grow up to be is also exciting. The places they will go. The places you've went, the places God has directed your life, that is exciting, is it not? And that's the way we think of the will of God. But first and foremost, the will of God is what? That you would be holy. This was the whole purpose of God intervening in our own depravity. As it says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? Not that we should have the best retirement plan and make it in this world and be popular, but that we should be holy. You see, one of God's chief concerns for us as his people is that we would be holy, that we would grow in him, that we would continue to pursue him, that we would continue to submit to him, and that as a church body, as a collection of individuals, in this heavenly embassy, as it were, people that are here collecting themselves together, first we would be holy as a body, but also as individuals that we would be growing. What is the will of God for our life? That we would be following him and growing closer and closer to him through it all. And we'll get into how this works out for the will of God in the future in a second, but I want us to first see that. Okay, and he uses two examples here. When he says, thy will be done, you can see he attaches it to an example. Thy will be done. How is it that your will would be done? And this is where we're going to see that this is explicitly talking about his prescriptive will, a prescription as it were. 
as in heaven, so in earth. How is it that we are to be doing the will of God? How is it that it works out? First, as it's done in heaven, we're hoping that it is done that way in earth. Now, everything in heaven does exactly, to crossing the T's, to dotting the I's, exactly as God commands. That's a blessing to know, that the angels, as we see them in heaven, are doing exactly, when he says, Gabriel, go and announce, they go and announce, right? When he tells Michael, the archangel, go and destroy, Michael goes and destroys. In heaven, there is nothing in the presence of God that could hinder obedience with the angels, with the seraphims, with the cherubs, with all of the celestial beings, with all of the souls and spirits of the saints that have went on before us. There is nothing hindering. They are in full obedience to God himself at all times. Praise God. And that's something to look forward to in our own mind, to think that one day everything that hinders us will be vanquished. Every sorrow, every bit of discouragement, every sin will be pulled from us, and we will be like those in heaven one day. Amen? Full obedience. But not just full obedience. You know, you can look at Habakkuk chapter 1, where it talks about no iniquity can stand before him in verse 13, but you can equally see not just is it that it is like a dictator rule where nothing bad happens. You know, Sometimes I can make my children stand up straight. They better not back talk. They better not say a word against me. One more word, I'm going to take every cable, every cord that you have, and you will not be able to play anything for a year. You know, I'll sell it. Call my bluff, right? <laughs> and you know, sometimes I'll say stuff like that, and they may be standing up straight, their shirt tucked in, their mouth may be shut, but they're not very happy about it. You see, you can have full obedience and to not be happy, cheerful, or joyful full obedience. You can have an iron fist, as it were. The red curtain, you probably remember that phrase from the Cold War era. You can have some type of authoritarian come up and you do what I say or you get slaughtered, and so you're either acting out of obedience from fear or constraint. So you can have that view, but in heaven it's different. In the very presence of God, they're not singing just because they're scared to do anything else. They're singing praise to God out of joy and cheer and gladness. So their obedience in heaven is not just perfect and full, but think about this. Their joy in heaven stems from a heart to prepare, that is prepared to sing praise to him through cheerfulness. In other words, they're not going before the Lord and said, all right, it's that time, right? You know, <laughs> everybody's done that, myself included. It's Saturday night, I better get something prepared, <laughs> you know. I better get something ready. I better have something prepared for that congregation because they're going to be expecting something, so let's get it together to where I can have to just say something to them, right? It's Saturday night, it's Sunday morning, the clock's ticking, got to get it ready. That's not what it is. It's Lord, my Lord. I get to talk about your gospel this morning. You see, it's out of a heart of a, a joyful heart. It's out of a heart of joy, not out of a heart of fear or a heart of obligation. In heaven, it's not just that they do everything exactly as they should do, which is true, but when you look at the scenes of Isaiah chapter 6 as they're flying around the throne of God saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, as they proclaim that thou art worthy, it doesn't look like they're just doing it because they have to. They're doing it because it is their joy and purpose to do so as his divine creation. If you look in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, as you see both of those heavenly scenes, they're not just up there singing stoically. I, I made the mistake one time. There's a church, and it's the only thing they remember about me. The only thing they remember about me. Always remember, the first thing you say and the last thing you say is typically the only thing people ever remember about you. <laughs> that is frustrating, especially when you have a mouth that never stops. And I got up there. They were having a big singing. And so I get up there, and the whole singing looked so just dry. Everybody was just kind of stoically staring. And I looked, and I said, brothers and sisters, let's not sing like we were baptized in lemon juice. <laughs> Let's sing like we mean it. We, we, don't, we use wine for communion, not pickle juice. Let's smile. 
And they all laughed and thought it was funny. Unfortunately, that's the only thing any of them still remember about me. <laughs> you know, the first thing they ever heard me say. So that's all they remember. But they remember it. But the point was, we serve a living God. How exciting is it to think that our God is sitting on the throne of the authority of all creation? How as exciting is it to think that that God who's out there is also your Father which is here? How exciting is it to know that though you were at enmity with Him, and not just that there was some divide that you couldn't breach, but you equally hated Him in your mind and your heart, and you would curse at Him in whether He gives you punishment or blessings. And to know that that God who sits on that throne that he could judge you sent his only son to die for you. To punish for your sin, be punished for your sins. How is it that we cannot sing praise to God with joy like the angels? You see, he gives this view of first in heaven. We want your will be, to be done as it's done in heaven. We want it to be done in earth. See, he sets the standard that as it's done in perfect obedience, we want it to be done in earth. Okay. Our heart's desire is for what? The will of God. Now, there is a sense, and I acknowledge this, there is a sense in which we desire for God's active will to be continually implemented. Even in Revelation chapter 22, when he says, when he looks and says, even so, Lord, come quickly. Is anything that we do or say going to make God come back any sooner? No. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 tells us that he's waiting for that last redeemed child of God to be born again, to be quickened by divine grace. Before he's coming back, nothing's going to speed it up. Nothing's going to slow it down. God does things on his own time sovereignly. Yet, our heart's desire is still what? That his will would be implemented. And I think sometimes, to some degree, we can bow our heads in times of sorrow and say, Lord, come quickly. Lord, in your active will, in your determining will in this sense, that as you are saving your people throughout all ages, as you have saved them on the cross, and now as you are quickening them by your Holy Spirit, Lord, come quickly. Please let it be this day that you come back. I don't think it's wrong to desire that, is it? I don't think it's wrong for God, for God to place in us a desire that today would be the day that he'd come back. I think all of us desire that. Just stop the pain. Stop the sorrow. Stop the death. Stop the sickness. Stop the trial. Stop the every single day in, day out frustration and depression. Lord, just stop it and come back, I beg. Lord, even so, come quickly. I don't think it's wrong to want that. But it's the want for that what dictates how it, his will is done in earth. Because this prayer is first concerning his prescriptive will or his will for us and how we act. Sometimes we say we want God's will in our life, but we should be asking, how is my life following God's will? We shouldn't be saying, Lord, what is your will for my life? But we should be actively saying, Lord, how can we be following you and implementing your will in my day in, day out activities? Again, I don't know what tomorrow holds. I have a general itinerary and plan. And ultimately, what God has for tomorrow is unrevealed to me. You know, there are certain things that are unrevealed to us. There's his revealed will that we fully know about. Everything that's revealed in his word and equally everything that has been in the past. We understand what that is, but Tomorrow, I don't know. This is why James tells us that we shouldn't say, I will do or I won't do, but just say, the Lord will. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I know who holds tomorrow, as the song says, but I don't know what tomorrow holds. So what my task is, as a believer in Jesus Christ, my task is to look to his word and fully implement it to the best of my ability. Now, when we do that... When we are following God as close as we can, it's interesting. When you see in the Bible somebody that may be looking towards the darkness instead of the light, and we can do that very often, can't we? You know, it's never that God ever walks away from us. It's just sometimes we remove our focus from our Savior. 
you can see that beautiful example, ironic, depressing, discouraging, yet beautiful example of what happens to Peter as he steps off into the water and he begins to sink when, when he takes his eyes off Christ. And that image that we're given there can equally be understood in the terms of will of God. When we begin to remove ourselves from implementing the will of God in our daily tasks is when we start wondering what the future holds. But when we focus our mind on doing everything we can for the moment, redeeming the time as it were, for the days are evil, redeeming the time, buying back the time, using the time wisely, not wasting the time, but when we're focused on that, what happens? Our mind transcends the problems and we're just like, Lord, what is it? Thy name be hallowed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You see, this is why he places these petitions at the beginning of the prayer because it affects how we think about the rest of the prayer. It changes the way we think about our daily life, about our own forgiveness. It changes the way we think about temptation because our first and chief goal is what? That God's name would be hallowed, that his kingdom would come, and that his will would be done. He begins by drawing our attention to the will of God. Okay, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know what he has revealed for us to do. You'll remember multiple times in the Gospels, the Pharisees would come and ask God for a sign. I think we've all done that. Lord, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Just give me a sign. What do I need to do? And I do not disagree that God gives us inclinations in what we should and should not do. God does burden our hearts, does he not? We talk about a pastor having a burden for a specific assembly and having a burden to go somewhere. I can testify specifically for myself, the move from Mississippi to Alabama was confusing to us. It was one of those that we just didn't understand. We were happy, very happy in Mississippi. Then all of a sudden, we were miserable, and it was like a light switch flipped. Happened at Thanksgiving. Typically, when we would drive to Birmingham, we would look and be like, oh, this is such a long drive. And if you've never driven between Oxford and Tupelo on Highway 6, it seriously, it's only about 40 minutes, but it feels like about six hours. It just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And we hated when we finally got to Tupelo and we're heading to Oxford because I was like, can we just get home? Can we just get home? And it didn't matter for what reason, Becca would not stop, right? It didn't matter who had to potty. We were going to be driving from that point to that point without stopping. But then all of a sudden it switched. We had this frustration that all of a sudden changed to where now we wanted to be here. We cried for three and a half hours one Thanksgiving from Birmingham to Mississippi. We thought we were crazy. Well, we said we can't affect what is going on around us. We don't know what God has tomorrow. All we can do is do what we can with where we're at now. All we can do is do what we can. So I committed myself to just praying and preaching and said God would make it known. God would make it evident. And within six months, God, without me trying to figure it out or say, God, tell me right now what you have for me tomorrow. Tell me right now what the next 10 year hold, 20 years old, 30 year hold. I just simply applied ourselves to the word of God in prayer and doing what I could do with the time that I do have. And God in his sovereign goodness and providence, every door that needed to be shut was shut. Every door that needed to be opened was opened. And as I applied myself to glorifying him and hallowing his name. Slowly, whatever door opened, I said, Lord, thy will be done. Amen. You see, it turned back to his determining will. It turned back to what he was doing. It turned back to it. Lord, while I'm doing your will, and I understand that your will is what I am seeking as I'm growing in holiness, we have a better view of God and his light and his goodness to where we say, Lord, whatever you would have me to do for whatever space of time you would have me do it, I will do it to the best of my ability. And Lord, I pray that in it that you're glorified. And this goes past just being something that is connected to any single person. This is equally something that is going to be connected to the whole of the body of Christ, the entirety of the church. There was one meeting I went to, and I don't mean this to sound irreverent when I say this. I'm not going to uh, use names or church bodies or anything like that. But we, my entire family, and when I say my entire family, this was actually before I was married, so this was Dad, me, and Ben, and we drove down there, and we would get in a car and we'd drive somewhere, and 
we went and we worshiped. Without giving names of pastors or ministers or churches, we left and all three of us were just like, we felt like we had not done anything that day. We hadn't worshiped. It was on a Saturday. Good two something hours plus away. We were super excited. The best thing about all of it, Dad paid for the gas, all the food, and all the snacks. So that was always a blessing about taking Dad with you to some of these meetings. And so we're on the way back, and I said, I just, I felt like we could have done something better with our day than that. And Dad looked confused at me. He said, what are you talking about, son? We were worshiping God. I said, we did the motions, but collectively we weren't doing his will. Sometimes even collectively as a church, implementing the will of God in an assembly is lost because we forget what the chief purpose is among us. Now, everything flows from this, and I don't want you to lose what I'm saying right now. Is it true that we are to implement the worship service of God according to the Bible and only to that rule and authority? The answer is (laughs) yes. Yes, only to the rule of authority, yes. Is it true that we are to believe exactly as the Bible says and prescribes according to salvation by grace alone through Christ alone and only by his finished work? Yes. But we're not doing it just because we want to be right. You see, we're doing it because we want to do the will of God. We want to see his kingdom fully manifest And most importantly, most chiefly, and first of all, above all else, I want to see my God's name glorified, hallowed, and reverenced in this world. You see, before everything else, and that's why I do everything that I do. This is why I'm seeking the will of God. This is why, you know, why is it that I study the word of God every single day and I want to be right in a sense? It's not because I want to be right, and I do like being right. (laughs) Ask my wife. I love being right. Right. But it's not because I want to be right. It's because I want God to be glorified the most that he can be through this physical, temporal body, this earthen vessel as the Bible calls it. I want God to be glorified. Why do we meet together in a church? Why is it that we focus so much on truth? Why is it that we believe in the regulatory principles of worship and try to do what the Bible says and nothing else? It's not because we want to be right, but it's because we want to be God to be glorified. It's because we want to see his kingdom come. It's because we want his will, not my will, to be implemented. This is a frightening view. Sometimes we don't like the idea of Somebody else's will applied over our will. I think every single one of us has that inside of us. That's why, again, we mentioned this a few weeks ago. That's why children have to be taught how to share and behave. You don't have to teach them how to fist fight. (laughs) I have two boys, and I have a brother. You don't have to teach that. (laughs) You don't teach those things. It just naturally happens. However, Unfortunately, because of that and the residual effects of sin that still exists in our flesh and that nature, sometimes we get frustrated when the idea of our will is impugned. Brothers and sisters, there is a computer term and word processor that's called alignment. Sometimes you say it justify the words. You move it from page to page. The idea that we're given here is that we are setting a certain alignment for ourselves, that we are pushing ourselves to where God says we should be. Thy will be done. Romans chapter 12 reads it this way, and you can read this both collectively and individually as we see the church being commanded here, and it's no mistake that he begins as I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Therefore is not given just out of context and place there, but it's given as it's built up from the fact that we are the foreknown, predestinated, called, justified, glorified, We're those to whom Christ loved, and now as Gentiles, we're also an unnatural branch, being given the knowledge of the truth in the church of the living God. So it's no mistaking that he would here say, I beseech you, therefore, I'm exhorting you because of what I just said. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
You see, the idea is that we are being continually transformed in our life, both individually. There never comes a point to where we've stopped growing in the knowledge and grace of our Lord and in our own personal holiness. There's never a point where we say, I've graduated, right? And that's unfortunate. I'm looking forward to the summer when I can say, I graduated, and I'm never going back. <laughs> I'm never doing it again. And my wife says, amen, never, ever, ever again. But there never comes a point until glory to where the struggle ends. And this is why he begins the prayer this way. Before he goes anywhere else, he first attaches our minds to the glory of God as our chief desire in prayer. And from that, flowing all the way into this kingdom being implemented into the world, then to the will of God being worked out in us, that we, like the angels in heaven, the angels who sing praise in perfect harmony, the angels who do God's will in everything, who never sin, who never ever step out of line, but do exactly as he commands, from a cheerful and joyful heart, Lord, as your will is done in heaven, let it be done in me. Let me sing praises to your son, not because I have to or it's obligation, but because I'm happy in you, because I'm cheerful, because I'm thankful that you are my God. Let it be done in me. Let it be done in my heart, and let it be done also in all of the assembly. My God. Let me praise you. Is that our first three petitions in prayer? That God's will would be done above everything else, that his name would be honored. Is that the position of our heart as we worship? I'll close with this. Sometimes this seems almost redundant to think that our chief desire would be the glory of God. Sometimes I get a, a little in on myself, and I think it happens with everybody. There's been various occasions where God has pulled me back in check and reminded me what's important. If you ever visit among various other areas of the country, I'll use it that way, and there are certain idiosyncrasies that they may do that we don't do. I remember the first time um, I was in a church, a primitive Baptist church in a association in South Georgia that passed the plate. And, you know, the difference between us and them, you know, we pass by the plate and they pass the plate. Well, the only difference really is 10 percent. I'm <laughs> kidding. And, you know, I kind of laughed because I, I, I first got shocked. Oh, what are they doing? You know, and I jump and, and I'm thinking about it for 30, 40 minutes and I'm getting kind of frustrated. And because my head was so focused on what I thought needed to be going on, I was missing my chief desire the whole time, which was glorifying God. One time I went to an assembly, and I'll tell you, I'm typically one that was, says, all right, let's get more lively. This was an assembly that I said, all right, let's calm down, <laughs> order. I, I went to, and, and I love these folks, Patrick Porter is the pastor of this church in Oxford. I went to an African-American Primitive Baptist church, and I'll tell you, they were lively. And I stood out in the crowd. I was, let's say, the only person that looked anything like me there. So everybody turned and looked at me. Brother Patrick come, came and asked me to sit up in the pulpit with the other ministers. and So I stood out. He asked me to preach first that day. Things were done a little bit differently. It was the same to some degree because it was a cappella congregational singing. I was listening. You know me. I'm, I got big ears. I was listening to what they were preaching. It was all the same. But God had worked on me a lot between that first instance to the second instance. God had worked on me. That was some of the most fun I ever had in worship. <laughs> they were slapping me on the back, amen. And they were having a good old time. I thought, guys, I need to bring some of this with me. You know, y'all are, are happy to be here. You know what? Sometimes worship can be day-to-day -day depending on which person I am. Sometimes it's the second to where I'm really happy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm there. You know, I don't care... Who's there? Who's not there? I just want to worship God because that is my chief concern. But sometimes I still go back to that first one. For maybe that one person is there that has made me mad. Maybe that one thing that week in life has affected me so much that I've brought it into worship that day. And I've lost my chief joy, which is in God. 
And so everything from the world is compiled on my shoulders that morning, and I am forgetting that I am to be implementing his will so that his kingdom would come, so that his name would be reverenced. I'm forgetting that my first petitions and prayer are not about me. Brothers and sisters, this prayer radicalizes how we approach God. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven, so in earth. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and your knowledge and your love that you've given to us through your word, which is your revealed prescriptive will. We pray, Lord, that we know not what you will bring in our lives from day to day. Lord, we know that you are not the cause of darkness, the cause of sin, that you have no wickedness in you, and you are not the cause of temptation or evil. But, Lord, we know that except you govern our lives, Lord, we are lost in darkness. We pray, Lord, that though we don't know what tomorrow holds, that we would diligently seek you, redeeming the time and all things that we do, that as we wake up in the morning, that our first thought would be how we are to implement your will that day, that we would be seeking to do what you've commanded us to do and not be conformed to this world, but that we would be transformed by the renewing of the mind and that we would testify to the world around us what the will of God is. Lord, as we come to worship this morning, as we come to seek you, as we now leave to serve, we pray, Lord, that our will would not be our chief concern, but that, Lord, whatever small time we have with our family, with our friends, with our church, that we would first be focused on one thing, and that is to reverence your name and that you would be glorified. Lord, let us now adopt that mindset. We pray, gracious God, that we would be fo first focused on your glory, that we would be first focused on your kingdom being more manifest in our communities, and that, Lord, that in all things your will would be done in my life and in this church. We beg. In your name we pray, and amen.